now, um, and then um, I'm really sorry, but our guest speaker is me <laughs> this morning. Oh, you guys are kind. That's very kind. Um, so let, but before we get to that, uh, let's, let's hear from God's Word. Uh, we're in John 15, uh, verses 9 to 17. It'll be on the screens, but you might want to have it open. We're going to keep coming back to it throughout our, throughout our time together. John 15, verses 9 to 17. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amazing. Let's just take a moment to pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these words you've spoken to your disciples 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, and that you, uh, as we're going to find out, you say them to us today as well. Lord, come and speak by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Give us hearts to hear what you're saying. Amen. Amen. I want to begin with a little story. On Remembrance Sunday in 1970, a nine-year-old boy named Steve showed up at the parish church of St. Andrews. We've got a little picture of Steve. He showed up at the parish church in the small Cotswold village of Miseden. And he showed up with a trumpet in his hand. In fact, up he, in fact, he showed up with a trumpet in his trembling hands because this nine-year-old boy had been asked to play the last post at the Remembrance Day service. And as I'm sure you can imagine, he really wanted to get it right. He really wanted to honor the, the veterans and the congregation there as they came together for this act of remembrance. And on that particular Sunday, Steve played beautifully. He played the last post with more respect and nuance and beauty than any nine-year-old really had any business doing. And so he was invited back the next year, and the next year, and the next year, to the point where eventually Steve was, was no longer trembling when he showed up because he knew how to do this now. He knew how to play the last post. He played it year on year on year. It was like memory for him. Now, the important thing now wasn't the skill needed to play that piece of music. The important thing was that Steve simply showed up, and he showed up, and he showed up. Even in his teenage years, when he he didn't really want to get out of bed on a November Sunday, he showed up. Even when he got married and had kids, he'd bring them along to mark that moment of remembrance together. He showed up. In the hard years and in the good years, with whatever was going on in his life, he showed up, and he showed up, and he showed up. And I can tell you that if you were not here and you weren't in Plymouth with the Archbishop of Canterbury's remembrance service today and you were in that same small village in Gloucestershire, you would find Steve playing the last post at the Remembrance Sunday service in Miserdom for the 53rd year in a row. Because once again, he's shown up. And I know all of this because Steve's my dad. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I'll take him a round of applause for being the son of my dad, definitely. Um, and so I know it's not just Remembrance Sunday. I know that Steve Harper is the kind of guy who shows up. Throughout my life, he's been the kind of, of dad who shows up. And in that regard, I, I know I'm extremely privileged. But because of this, I guess when it comes to this day, when it comes to Remembrance Sunday, in amongst a lot of other stuff, I think of my dad showing up. And I also think of his granddad. I think of my great-granddad, Leonard, who lived in Newton Abbott, and he showed up to serve during the Second World War. I think of the countless men and women who, who, like him, showed up during the wars to protect and serve their communities. And I think of this national yearly habit we have of showing up each year, like we will later in this service, to honor their memory and the memory of all those who have died in war and to reflect upon the brokenness of a world where war sadly still abounds. 
I had the great privilege yesterday of uh, being over in Torquay at a remembrance service that was being led by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. And he spoke there of how at the moment the world feels like it's come off its hinges. And we're conscious of Ukraine and Russia. We're conscious of Israel and Gaza. We're conscious of Sudan and Nagorno-Karabakh and a million other conflicts that can't even fit onto the news feeds. We're conscious of those places for whom remembrance isn't a yearly habit, but it's a living reality. They're remembering the dead every day. And I don't know about you, but when I consider the news at the moment, I am consistently lost for words. And, and it breaks our hearts. It breaks my heart. And if I'm honest, my, my prayer is that our hearts would continue to break for the things that break God's heart. And that our hearts would continue to yearn for Christ to come again and welcome us into that reality which we read of in Isaiah 2, a passage that's traditionally read on this day. Isaiah 2, where it says, He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. That's our hope. A day where swords are beaten into plowshares because there's no use for them anymore. But between that day and this day where we find ourselves now, I think often of our passage from John 15, which is inscribed on war memorials up and down the country, where Jesus tells his followers, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. In the midst of a world which feels so broken, I don't know about you, but friendship, when I read this passage, I kind of feel like friendship feels like a bit of a twee concept, almost feels a little bit childish. And yet in our passage for today, Jesus seems to say that there is power to loving one another that we can't even begin to comprehend. And he commands us, that is pretty strong language, right? He commands us to love each other. And so, friends, this morning, let's consider friendship. Friendship with God and friendship with each other. Because so often, friendship is rooted in the power of showing up, of laying down our own desires and preferences and lives for each other. And this is enormously countercultural uh, because in our, in our Western individualist culture, we're, we're surrounded by slogans and messages like, You do you, be true to yourself, follow your heart, and find yourself. And these are messages which tell us that our individual freedom and expressing that individual freedom, that's the highest good in our culture. It's the most important thing. However, the problem with that, as Mark Sayers, the theologian and pastor Mark Sayers puts it, he says that at some point, the endless quest for freedom will run up against the boundaries of reality. All too often, rather than accepting our own limitations as human beings, rather than accepting the fact that we're not divine and we can't do everything, we seek to try and remove the obvious boundaries in our lives through our own means. And what are the first things to go often? What are the most obvious boundaries in our lives? Our relationships with other human beings. Other human beings, I don't know if you know this, other human beings sometimes get in the way of each other. I used to work in a, in a shop long, long ago, um, in a bookshop, and I used to always think, I would love working in this bookshop if it wasn't for all the people. It would be much easier if it was just me and all the books, and they, people didn't come and keep messing up all the books. I wanted a world without the boundaries of other people. And so our culture has bred within us this sense that whilst it's nice to have other people in our lives, we're the main character in the movie of our lives. And so if other people inconvenience us in any way or keep us from our own personal freedom of choice, then they're keeping us from the best things that life has to offer us. We tend towards what the philosopher Charles Taylor called the buffered self. We become people who put buffers up between ourselves and other people. Our culture says that freedom is all about me following my preferences. And so committed relationships and friendships and committing to a community like we want to do here at Bay Church these are all seen as barriers to following our own preferences. But here's a question. Do we want a life based on our preferences or on God's purposes? Because in our passage for today, Jesus outlines this beautiful vision for what our relationships with each other could look like in light of the relationship he invites us into with him first. But it's countercultural and it might, it might just change the world. Because ultimately, when we show up, we show love. 
And when we show people love, we show people a glimpse of God. And when people are showing God, people change. Lives change. Communities change. Nations change. And ultimately, we show up because God showed up first. That's the first point I want to make this morning. God has shown up for us. Jesus calls us friends. Now, it's been a bit of a weird week for me this week, in all honesty. Um, I, I, like I said, I, not only did I have the chance to meet the Archbishop of Canterbury yesterday in Torquay, which was lovely, um, but I also had the great privilege this week of being at a conference in Oxford uh, where the theologian and former Bishop of Durham, uh, a guy called N.T. Wright, was speaking. Now, I feel like we quote N.T. Wright constantly here. I'm not going to quote him today. I'm just going to talk about him. Because uh, I'm not going to lie, N.T. Wright is a little bit of a hero of mine. Is it nerdy to have a hero who is a theologian? Yes. And I don't care. Um, but something I've noticed about myself over the years is that I am really bad at talking to people who I perceive to be even a little bit famous. Right? So, um, <laughs> and that is exactly what happened on Thursday uh, when I was stood about a meter away from N.T. Wright. <gasps> He's right there. And my brain just couldn't decide whether I should play it cool and respectable and just be like, oh, hey. Senti right over there. And like, at like my one bid to maybe make like his only impression of me as a human being be one of like, oh, that guy seems cool and respectable. Um, or if I should just be a total fanboy and ask him for a selfie. I couldn't decide. I couldn't decide. And in, my bra- in, in the end, my brain just like short circuited and I did nothing. I just sort of stood there. He smiled at me. It was like the whole world smiled at me. No, uh, he smiled at me and I smiled back and that was it. And I thought to myself, my one chance to become friends with N.T. Wright is gone. That was it, my only chance. (laughs) Oh, dear. And I tell you this story today because I wonder if sometimes, I wonder if sometimes we can imagine it's the same with Jesus. You might feel like you deeply respect and admire Jesus, but that ultimately Jesus is this person you don't really know and who has absolutely no idea who you are. You might feel like at best Jesus wants to give you a a sort of a nice, polite smile. I love N.T. Wright, but I'm not, (laughs) my wife's laughing very hard down here. Um, I love N.T. Wright, but I'm not friends with him yet. (laughs) I love N.T. Wright, but I'm not friends with him, right? And sometimes for some of us, it might feel like I love Jesus, but I'm not friends with him. I love Jesus, but I'm not friends with him. Do do you resonate with that? But Jesus says, Jesus says, I have called you friend. It's right there in verse 15. I have called you friends. More than that, Jesus says, I have chosen you. And you might be thinking, well, all right, Gareth, but he's, he's actually speaking to the disciples in first century Jerusalem in this text, not specifically to me, not to us in 21st century Torbay. But Jesus makes it quite clear that we can be his friends. He calls us friend too. Verse 14, Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command. And you might be thinking, oh, that's a a pretty big if there. If I've got to keep some commands, then maybe Jesus doesn't call me a friend. Maybe I won't be able to keep the commands. But firstly, Jesus knows we're human. He knows who he's inviting to be his friends. He knows we'll struggle with the commands. He doesn't let us do this alone. And here's the commands Jesus gives us to keep. Firstly, he says, remain in my love. That's the first one. Remain in my love. Verse 9, accept the fact that Jesus loves you. That's the first bit. Accept it. Accept the fact that Jesus loves you and wants to call you friend. And the second one flows out of that is to love each other. That's it. Even when we feel like we have no business showing up to Jesus, Jesus shows up to us and calls us friend. More than that, he says he loves us, not with like a a, a twee, fluffy, rom-com, sort of Hugh Grant kind of love. I mean, I love Hugh Grant, but you know, not that sort of like twee, fluffy kind of love, but with a love which flows from the very heart of God, from the very heart of the relationship between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Verses 9 and 10, he says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. That is to say that in some way, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is not stingy in sharing the love. I remember about eight years ago, I was going through a pretty rough bit in life, and I was 
I was really struggling with the idea that God would care about little old me and my problems. At best, I would kind of imagine that God had more important things to worry about than me. And at worst, I would, I would imagine that God was just getting ready to lob a lightning bolt at me for being so whingy all the time in my prayer life. And then a friend said to me, you do realize that if you're imagining God to be a, a grumpy old dude with a, with a long beard, riding around on a cloud, who doesn't really want anything to do with you, but every now and then wants to throw lightning bolts at you, you're not imagining the God of the Bible. You're imagining Zeus. The God from Greek mythology. And that, that's not right. And it blew my mind. I had to unpick a lot of that stuff. And, and, and friends drew along alongside me to help me put back together what I thought about God. And what I thought he thought about me. And I want to make the same gentle challenge to us today. What do you imagine when you think of God? What do you imagine God thinks of you? Because the God the Bible talks about is dynamic, not static. He's not far off and distant as if he couldn't be bothered to get off his cloud for you. The God of the Bible is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three and one in endless, loving, perfect relationship and inviting you to partake in that same love. The God of the Bible showed up for us all in the person of Jesus Christ. He came to us as a baby who grew up to be a man who invited us into friendship with God and then by his death and resurrection made a way for it to happen. We are invited to be in relationship with God. You are my friends, Jesus says to each and every one of us. This implies an absolutely stunning level of intimacy and the interaction with the one who is also the eternal, almighty creator of the universe. We need to get used to that, that he loves us and calls us friends. Do you know that in the Old Testament, only Abraham and Moses are called friends of God? And yet here in this passage, Jesus extends the privilege to all of us. If we remain in his love and love each other, friendship is defined by Jesus' love. To be Jesus' friend is to love Jesus and be loved by him. We show up. Because God showed up for us first in the person of Jesus Christ. And because God has shown up for us, we're now called to show up for each other. And so here's my second point. Jesus is our pattern for friendship. Jesus shows us what true friendship is all about. And he calls us to show up and love one another. In a study released earlier this year, almost half of adults in the UK report feeling lonely occasionally or sometimes. Four million adults in the UK experience chronic loneliness, meaning they feel lonely often or always. One in 10 people in the UK say that they don't have a single real friend. These are heart-wrenching statistics. And they're not just statistics, are they? Because we're people. We're people in the UK. Those statistics are about us. Those statistics are about our families, our friends, our colleagues, the people we see at the school gate, the lady working at Tesco, the bloke who delivers your post, everyone in our community and everyone in our our church family. And so these statistics matter. And they flow from the story of individualism. We are a nation of buffered people because we've been taught to prefer our own preferences. At primary school, my friends were the people who were also obsessed with football. At secondary school, my friends were the people who listened to the same music as me. At university, my friends were the people on the same course as me. I made friends with the people who were like me because they shared the same preferences as me. And in one sense, that's pretty normal. But what our culture coaches us us to not bother too much with those people when our preferences change and to definitely not bother with people who we share no preferences with. We find it so much easier to be friends with people who are exactly like us. And ultimately, it's not a huge leap from there to begin to think, oh, I just thought I'd jazz it up with a sort of disco vibe for you there. So, whoa, uh, keep you on your toes. Um, And ultimately, it's not a huge leap from there to begin to think that maybe it will just be easiest to be friends with nobody but ourselves. That way, we'll always get our way. We become, as Martin Luther put it, curved in upon ourselves. But Jesus models to us a different way. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. To lay down our lives, our preferences, our individual pursuits, our problems with each other, our whole being, to lay it down for each other. He acknowledges that we're going to find this hard and countercultural. 
Greater love has no one than this. There's no bigger or harder way of doing love than this. And don't the disciples that he's talking to here, don't they just know it? I can imagine the knowing looks at each other as Jesus says this. Jesus makes it clear again in verse 16 that he's chosen these disciples. Because otherwise, do you think they're the kind of people who would have chosen to hang out together? Amongst the disciples, you've got a guy called Matthew, who before Jesus called him, worked as a tax collector for the Roman government. And you've got a guy called Simon, who before Jesus called him was a zealot, somebody who was trying to overthrow the Roman government, and who as such would absolutely hated tax collectors. Simon and Matthew would have been sworn enemies once upon a time. And yet here they both are amongst Jesus' first followers, laying down their lives to become friends. Friends of each other and friends of Christ. They lay down their lives for each other because Jesus shows them what that looks like. And ultimately, he shows us all what it looks like to lay down our lives for our friends. Jesus' death on the cross is the ultimate demonstration of love. He lays down his own life, his own preferences, and so also that death would be defeated. And we, his friends, could be set free from the shackles of our sin and shame. Jesus laid down his life for us so that we might know he calls us friends. And the remarkable thing is, the laying down, that's not where the story ends. The laying down is not the point of the story. The relationship is. Jesus lays down his life, but he doesn't leave it lying down. He was raised from the dead. The tomb is now empty. Jesus is alive and ascended on high, seated at the right hand of the Father. Jesus didn't lay down his life just for the sake of it. He laid down his life for the sake of us. The self-sacrifice is not the point. The self-sacrifice leads to relationship. Fullness of relationship with the living God. This is what Jesus offers us by his death and his resurrection. And it's the pattern that he offers, offers us in this passage for all of our relationships. Just as the Father's love for Jesus mirrors Jesus' love for us, Jesus then asks us to mirror that love in our own actions towards each other. We're not called to lay down our lives for each other just for the sake of it. We're called to lay down our lives so that we might enter into the fullness of relationship with each other. Theologian Chloe Lynch puts it beautifully when she says, it is in human friendship that we respond in mutuality to and are formed together in love towards the friend in whom all other friendship finds its place. So friends, love each other. Commit to one another. Put yourself in spaces where you'll spend time with people you might never spend time with otherwise. Hang out with somebody whose life is completely different to yours. Call the friends you grew up with. Make it a monthly habit. Turn up for the friends who are going through a rough patch. Be that awkward person who asks people how they really are. Equip your children to make friends. Be great friends. And then be friends with them when they grow up. Drive two hours to see your best mate. Or drive two hours to make a best mate. Whatever you need to do. Start that new hobby you've been dreaming about so you can make new friends. Find two other people and invite them to start a table with you. Join a group, join a crew, come on a Sunday, all that stuff we talk about on a Sunday. We do it because we want you to be in a space where you can find friends, where you can be in committed friendships with each other. And invite your friends. Pray for your friends. Pray to make friends. Pray for an enlarged heart to love your friends, to love the people you encounter in the places and spaces you inhabit. Because Jesus has called us friends. And he commands us to grow in friendship with each other. This is his command. Love each other. When we show up, we show love. When we show people love, we show people a glimpse of God. And I really believe that when people are shown God, then people change. When we lay our lives down to point our friends toward the one who desires to call them friend, then lives change. When we truly to begin to understand that we are called friend by the one in whom all friendship finds its place, then communities and nations and lives will change. Amen.